Hey everybody, Jem Schofield of the C47 and another episode of Gearbox 2.0. In this episode, a very special episode, we're gonna be taking a look at the brand new Fujifilm X-T4. Wanna learn more about it? Let's go. We've got some housekeeping to do before we get started with this episode. Number one, if you are new to this channel, and you might be new to this channel because you're coming here for this content, please subscribe here at the C47. Lots of content about production, lighting, cameras, audio, um, this stuff every week. If you're interested in this stuff, there's stuff here on this channel for you. Number two, I wanna say right off the bat that this is a pre-production version of the X-T4. It came in the box without a manual. This is not final firmware and that is the deal with this. I have it for a very short period of time, so I'm gonna kind of give you some of my initial thoughts. I'll put time code stamps down at the bottom in the description for some of the key stuff inside of this video, and I'll cover as much as I can within the limited time that I have. Trust me, there will be a lot more content around this camera in the future once it ships and I actually get it back into my hands. So there'll be a lot of videos out there that talk about this camera in terms of a stills camera. There'll be videos that talk about it as stills and video. And what this is gonna be all about is just video capabilities. I created some content on this channel on the X-T3. A lot of that content is relevant to this camera as well. So if you wanna check that out, especially sort of the little quick start that I have, which I'll put in the description, you can go through that where it talks about some of the menus. But rest assured, I have a monitor here. We'll be getting this camera onto here and we'll be talking about some of the menu items and things you should know about. Now, let's talk about some of the hardware parts about this camera first and foremost. The camera itself is just, from what I can tell, slightly taller. Again, we have no manual. I got to ask Fuji a few questions about the camera, and the body feels almost the same as the X-T3, though it does feel just slightly larger. And one of the reasons that this body is slightly larger is because one of the new big features in the camera, of course, is that we have in-body image stabilization built in. There's also a digital stabilization, which I'll talk to you about when we get to the menus. Um, grip feels about the same. Maybe it's just because of the slight changes. It feels even slightly better in my hand than the X-T3, not that the X-T3 was bad. Okay, and then the other big difference is, of course, this screen, and that is something that people have been asking for. Now, I have wanted to be able to do this for a long time so that I don't have to set up an external monitor and attach that to the camera. And it's well designed. There are a couple of gotchas which we'll talk about in a minute, but overall I'm really happy with that. So one of the things that I will talk about when it comes to the difference with the screen is that here on the X-T3, if you're shooting with a gimbal, it's really nice because you can just articulate the screen that way. Now, of course, we don't have any of that additional functionality, but it is nice to be able to do that. And with the X-T4, you should just understand that, yes, we're getting the selfie mode, but when it's in this position, you cannot rotate the screen in that way inside of the body. So that is going to be in certain situations a little bit of a disadvantage. Of course, you can put it on a gimbal and I already have, so it's not the end of the world. And of course, the big thing is being able to do this and I'll take this over that any day of the week. And dials wise, they look very, very similar. One of the big changes is right here on the back of the camera. When we have our shutter dial here, there's a sub dial which allows you to switch between stills mode and movie mode. So the nice thing about this is that when you switch it over to movie and you turn the camera on, all of your menus and your menu system is just for shooting video as opposed to the way it is on this camera where you have this combined menu, which can quite honestly get a little bit clunky unless you create your own menu system. We have a new battery 
that is available for this. It's not gonna work with the batteries from the X-T3. And this particular battery is definitely higher capacity. I could see having, if you were just shooting with the camera body itself, four of these. There's also gonna be a new dual charger that you can use and charge two of these at the same time. And then over here on this side of the camera is where your card slots are. There's two of them, just like on the X-T3. The difference is this door is removable, so if you have certain cages, you can actually rig it a certain way and have access to that. I'll say that one of the big changes for me when it comes to the dual card slots is that you can go into the menu system on this camera and you can actually record to both cards at the same time. So I think that's great, especially because so many of us when we're shooting with these cameras are by ourselves or with just one other person. Let's go ahead and take a look at the other side of the camera body and take a look at what ports we have inside of there. You can see here that we have a USB-C, which you can actually charge the camera with. In fact, what comes with the camera is an AC adapter and a USB-C to USB-C cable. There's also another adapter inside of here, and this brings up another conversation, which is that on this camera, there's a dedicated headphone jack on this camera. What you have to do is you plug this adapter into here, and then you can monitor your audio that way. Now that's really because of the IBIS system, and there's only so much room you can have in a camera like this without making it much bigger. If you want a dedicated headphone jack, you'll get the vertical grip, which will allow you to have two of those batteries inside of the grip and the dedicated normal headphone jack on there. And then up here, our other ports, we have our remote port. It's not something I'm using really for video. Um, hopefully some future gimbals like this one here will support more control over the XT series using that remote. And then over here is your mic jack, which is of course important. One of the things that I would recommend is make sure you get your screen into the position that you want it to be in before you start plugging things in. So if you're gonna use this in selfie mode, make sure that the screen is out so that when you flip it out, you don't have to try to turn it and get in the way of things that are plugged into there. Um, Conversely, if you want that screen to be facing you, make sure that it's in the position you want because inevitably when something's actually plugged into here, especially something inside of this mic port, it is going to go ahead and bump into that. So just make sure that the orientation of the screen is where you need it to be. And those are some of the little gotchas when you're talking about the actual camera body itself. I do wanna talk about lenses for a second because now that we have in-body image stabilization and we also have digital stabilization in the camera system, it kind of opens up for me what choices I have when I'm shooting video. I love the 18-55. to I think it's one of the best kit lenses that's out there. It's a capable lens for video. The 16-80 to is also a really great lens in terms of the look and feel but neither of those lenses are tuned to video except for the optical image stabilization that they have. When you are actually changing focal lengths, uh, it's very steppy and the functionality is not necessarily what you would expect out of a zoom lens when you're shooting video. So for me, I've always been attracted to and I've always wanted to have some sort of stabilization so that I could use these prime lenses that do not have IS built into them in video applications and more than just being on a gimbal or up on sticks. So that means that coupled with what I think are great matches for both of these cameras, but especially now with IBIS, the X-T4, you have a weather resistant body and you can use their weather resistant prime lenses. So for me, a great set would be the 16 28. You've got the 23 F2, you've got the 35, which I've owned for a long time, F2, which I love, and then you also have the 50 millimeter. And that little set of prime lenses will get you really far in terms of the productions that you're doing. Beyond using native Fujifilm X-mount lenses made by Fuji or third-party manufacturers, now the really exciting thing for me is all of those lenses that I wanted to use with the X-T3, which doesn't have IBIS, I can now use with this. Of course, I could use these on sticks or on a gimbal, but this really takes it to another place because these are some old Olympus OM Zuko lenses. This is one of my favorite lenses that I own. 
it's super soft wide open. It's a 55-1-2. And all I have to do is just take an adapter like this and I can pop this onto here. Let me just go ahead and line it up. And now I can attach this to this camera, but I get that image stabilization that's built into the body itself. So I've got these, I've got some old Nikon or Nikon Nikkor lenses. You can of course find lots of third party lenses out there that are vintage that you could use with this camera body now that it has that stabilization in it. Okay, it's enough of that. Enough of talking about the camera body and things like that. I think it's time to get this up onto the gimbal here and we'll start pushing the menus to this screen. I'll start taking you through some stuff and then we can also take a look at some footage together. I've decided, so you're not seeing my hand come into frame all of the time when I'm going through this, that I'm gonna push the menus to the Ninja 5. And this, quite honestly, is probably currently the best match for external recording with the X-T4 because it will support what's coming over HDMI, which is 10-bit 422 as opposed to 10-bit 420 internally in the camera system. It's small, a lot of media options for it. Um, I like it. I think it's a good match for this particular setup when you are using that. And just because there'll be comments and people are asking, I'm testing out the Weeble S right now and seeing how this fits with this whole camera system. I'm feeling pretty good about it right now, um, but you know we'll sort of see how that goes. Again, future videos, more content, so on and so forth. By the way, I just want to acknowledge something. As I'm pushing this stuff to this Ninja 5 right here, you will see that there's some cutoff on the menu just a little bit. And the reason for that is because the native resolution of this screen is not 16 by nine. And really the only people who are pushing menus externally are people like me who are using this educationally. But I didn't want this to be shaking all of the time. And I also didn't want you to be looking at my hands coming into frame all of the time. So the first thing you'll see is that I'm in a my menu for my setup right now. And I'm doing this for a reason, at least with the current firmware with the camera. And again, this is pre-production, not shipping firmware with the camera. It does not remember where you were last in the overall menu system when you back out of it and you go back into the menu. A workaround for that is to go into basically your setup menu. You go up here to user setting and you'll see that there are two options to create a my menu, one for stills and one for movie or video mode. And when you go inside of here, you can add items, you can rank what order they show up in, and you can also remove items. Currently, with this firmware, there are 16 slots that are available. I'm using all of them, which is why add items is grayed out. When you go into rank items, again, you can decide what order those items are accessed in your My Menu, which is, of course, gonna be based on what you're accessing more readily and all of the time. And then if I just back out of here, you can also see you can remove items. And if I take some of those away from my 16 slots, I obviously can add additional ones. And the good thing is that when you back out of your menu and you go back into it, it's always gonna go back into your My Menu, at least currently the way things are. Now, I don't wanna stay in here right now because I wanna go into the main menu structure to cover some of the features that are inside of here. Again, some of these are in my My Menu, but I just wanna go over the nitty gritty here. So we're gonna go down the rabbit hole a little bit. Stick with me, it's gonna take a little bit of time, but if you really wanna learn some stuff about how you're gonna set up this camera and you're gonna use it, let's get into this right now. So the first thing that we have is we have movie mode. And this is where you're gonna be choosing basically your resolution, your frame rate, and also your bit rate that you're recording to. So currently I have this set to 4K 16 by nine, which is UHD 4K 3840 by 2160. I have it set to 23.98, though this is a world camera, so you can set it to 25, 50. And over here in terms of our bit rate, we have 100, we have 200 and 400. That can change depending on the resolution and the frame rate that you're recording in. For me, I have found that 200 megabits per second on a day-to-day -day basis is really the sweet spot. Okay, so let's go ahead and step out of that. And we're gonna go over to file format. We have three options here, quite honestly. The first one in my mind, if I'm using the camera, is the only one. 
And why is that? Because when I'm recording two SD cards on the camera system, it's giving me the option to record 10-bit 420. So it's the only option of the three that allows me to do that. They've added MP4, which is very universally accepted as a uh, format. But quite honestly, again, on this camera system, I'd go MOV H.265 unless your editing system is not capable of handling that. Full HD high-speed recording. Okay, so when we turn that on, we're now, of course, not recording in a 4K resolution, if that's what you had set before. We have some different choices here, and what you need to understand is that on the left-hand side, these are our conforming frame rates. So on the right-hand side is the frame rate that you're recording at, and then in camera, it's conforming to a particular frame rate. So if I wanted to wind up with 2398 as my final frame rate, and I'm shooting at 120 frames per second, it will shoot 120 frames per second, but it will lay down onto the card a file that will play back without conforming in post to 23.98. You'll also see the addition here of 240 frames per second. And I have to say that compared to some of the cameras out there, it's uh, quite clean. And sometimes that's not the case when you're doing off-speed recording. Don't forget, when you step out of here and you are recording there, there's my shutter speed. I'm gonna wanna go ahead and change that shutter speed and increase it. So I'm gonna go ahead and set that to a 240th. Generally, it's a doubling of whatever the frame rate you are within reason until you start to get into ridiculous phantom uh, frame rates. And that's a whole different conversation for a different day. But what is not a different conversation for a different day is that when you start to shoot at these higher frame rates, letting less light into the camera for each of those frames, these higher shutter speeds letting even less light into the camera combined together, you need a lot of light to be hitting the sensor. So you have to do that math. Um, you'll figure it out. Maybe I'll do a video on that one day. Okay, good. So let's go in back to the menu and we can shut this off. So we're back to our standard frame rate, which is currently again, 23.98 in UHD 4K. So now we're gonna go into movie compression. This is a pretty quick conversation. You would think that based on the math and the processing that the computer has to do that all intra or all iframes, every frame is an actual frame of video would be the best choice when you're shooting with the camera. I have personally found that at least in Final Cut Pro 10, and your mileage may vary, that long GOP 200 megabits per second, uh, you know, MOV H.265 is the, again, sweet spot for most of the stuff that I'm shooting. We're gonna go ahead and take a look at our F-Log hybrid log gamma options. Hybrid log gamma generally is to record something that's for broadcast television. But F-Log, of course, is going to be the option that you'll choose when you want to record the most dynamic range that this sensor and camera is capable of recording. This might be a good time to be thinking about recording at 400 megabits per second instead of 200. Really, where you're recording footage and you're going to be doing a lot of stuff to it in post-production. You have a bunch of different buttons on the camera system, and this button right here that's on the front is an assignable button, and I actually have that assigned, and let me just check, there we go. I have that assigned so that when I press it, if I'm shooting an F-Log, there's an F-Log view assist on. Now we had a view assist on the X-T3, but you had to go into the menu system in order to activate it. You can assign those assignable buttons by going into the setup menu. You go in here to button dial setting, and then the way I set that up is I went into function FN setting, and then you go through here and you can actually decide what the different buttons on the camera are going to do. All right, now we're gonna go down here, and this is a big one. This is IS mode, and we're gonna go ahead and talk about these two options. The first one is IBIS in-body image stabilization slash optical image stabilization, OIS. Um, basically what that means is that when you are attaching a lens to this camera system that is a prime lens, ideally a native Fuji X mount lens from Fujifilm, but you can also use third-party lenses, it's going to stabilize that footage. And then if you combine that with a lens that has optical image stabilization, like this 18 to 55, it's gonna use those in conjunction with each other. 
A lot of the lenses that Fujifilm have do not have optical image stabilization, so this is huge, um, including this 5612, which I absolutely love, and now I might actually consider using it in video applications. It was really just a stills lens. But also know that when you're combining IBIS and OIS, while I'm not focusing on stills for this video, it can allow you to shoot at much slower shutter speeds handheld, so there is a big advantage there. Now, there is one other option here, which is to have that IBIS OIS together plus a digital image stabilization. And what that's going to do is it's going to give you an additional 10% crop when you choose this feature. And if I step out here and we look at the screen, you'll see it says 1.1x crop. And that just means that it needs to have some room to do that digital image stabilization. I think you should try it. You should see how it performs based on the lenses you're using. I have found that with some lenses, with either of these two options, let me get back to those, because again, it's going to push me into the My menu. If I go into here and we take a look at that, that when you're using either of these two options, that for instance, on the Laowa 9mm, at least the way the camera is functioning right now, there's an overcompensation, and quite honestly, at such a wide angle, uh, you know, field of view and, and focal length, it's not necessary. And I would turn this off in those situations. So I'm just going to leave that on right now. And then um, a little bit of a gotcha here. Our zebras can be set to 50% uh, to 100%. This is just a wish list item for me. But when I'm shooting in log with a camera system and I don't have an external monitor like this, Yes, I can use the histogram, but it's really nice sometimes when you have zebras to be able to take an 18% gray card and actually put that up in the frame and actually expose to, in log, generally about 40 on there. And so when you set up your zebras to 40, they'll actually show up. Um, okay, so let's go ahead and get into some other stuff that is important. I'm just going to kind of go through these menus. And this is the big one here, which is film simulation. Now, of course, there's shortcuts to this using the D-pad when you're using the camera. We have all of the film simulations that we had previously inside of this camera system. Classic Chrome being one of my favorite to shoot with when I'm baking in a look inside of the camera. Recently, what we did is an interview. I used the X-T4 as the A camera, and then this, the X-T3, is a B camera. These two cameras have the same sensor, so getting this and using it now as A and that as B was fantastic because what we saw when we were bringing in the footage is, well, they matched, which doesn't always happen with these camera systems. And then this is the magic one right here, Eterna Bleach Bypass. I'm loving this. It's basically going to put a black and white image over a color image. It's kind of how it works. I mean, this goes back to film days. You're bypassing the bleaching process, and what you're going to wind up with is you're going to wind up with a lower saturation, higher contrast image. If you need pops of color, this is not the one to use, but I've been told that we're also going to be getting this film simulation available to download so you can use it in post as well. So one of the things that a lot of people like to do is they'll shoot in F-log with the camera system and then they'll go ahead and apply essentially as a LUT these film simulations in post. They do that for stills all the time as well. So under white balance, we have a couple of new options that I haven't seen before. One is auto white priority. One is auto ambient priority. You can go in here and you can set and adjust your white balance shift with those. I'll find out more about these a little bit later when there's a user manual available, but then you also have all of your other options that you've had in the past. I'm not a huge auto white balance fan because obviously as there are changes in the environment and what's in the frame, then that white balance is going to shift, but it's nice to see that there's an evolution going on there. AF mode, very, very similar to what we had with the X-T3. To me, the big change here, and I'm just going to step out of here and I'm going to press the joystick in on the camera, is the fact that I can now use this back dial over here and I can change the size of my focus point. And that was not possible in the X-T3. 
So in terms of autofocus capabilities, especially when you're using continuous and you're using the joystick to move that around, I find that you can be much, much more precise in terms of your focus point when you're using the camera. You can still make it as large as it was before, but we can get that smaller focus point that was previously only available when you were shooting stills with the X-T3. All right. I think that this video is going to be long enough now and should help you get a good idea of what this X-T4 is all about. Again, pre-production, not final firmware, so it can only get better from here. I want to thank Fujifilm for sending the camera out to me for this short period of time so I can actually create this content, have a look at it, and... One million percent, this is going to become my A camera with the X-T3 as my B camera for my mirrorless setup. These cameras made me excited about this form factor again. I really wasn't feeling it until the X-T3 came out. In fact, I was shooting with Fuji's cameras for stills, and man, that X-T3 was a shocker. This is so much better with the new features. IBIS, flip-out screen, Love that new Eterna bleach bypass. It's awesome. And I am using these cameras all of the time now to create content. If you like what you see, if you're learning things, subscribe to the channel, tap the bell if you want notifications, new content every week, recorded educational content, live streams. And again, if you're new to the channel, hopefully this has been helpful for you. If you're an X-T3 owner, don't forget to look at the description. There's a link to your setup for that camera system. A lot of similarities. We've just got more stuff inside of this one. That's about it. I'll see you guys next time on Gearbox.